Norman, I want to know something personal about you as usual today. Today's, oh, gosh, I'm crossing my legs now. <laughs> today's question without notice is, what's your blood type? I am A positive. What are you? <gasps> I, you know, I'm an overachiever, but when I got my blood test, I only got an A minus. Oh. So I'm, a, a-. I'm a negative. Two right. A's. What a surprise. Yeah. Well, that's right, because it's very common out there. No, not because it's common. It's because we're awesome. We're both A's. That's what oh, I'm saying. Oh, A for awesome. Right. A for awesome. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? Oh, no way. Oh, right? my gosh, Norman. <laughs> my spelling's wrong. A plus plus A, well, A plus and A minus over here answering your health questions on What's That Rash? This week's question comes from Nadia, who says, is it true that there are specific diets for each blood type? For example, if you're B positive, is it better to eat or avoid some food? And she wants to know if that's true, are genes involved in this as well? Are there special blood tests to give true information about what food goes well with each individual body? The blood type diet, I remember seeing this book at like a friend's mum's place one time as one of the many diet fad books that seemed to go around in, I want to say like the 90s? Yeah, it was the 90s. This all started with a naturopath called Peter Damo who published a book where he reckons that people could be healthier, live longer and achieve their ideal weight by eating according to their blood type. The theory was that your blood type was closely tied to our metabolism, our ability to digest certain types of food, and therefore if you could tailor it, you were much better off. And as we often say on What's That Rush, some ideas that emerge, which sound a bit alternative, do have a core in science. Ooh, I'm really excited to dig into this. I do feel like, though, we need to start with, I guess it's a confession from me, Blood types are one of those things that, like, I know that they exist, but I've never really been very clear on what they actually are. So imagine a cell, a red blood cell, which for the sense it's not quite round, but imagine it's round, it's red, and it's got a surface on it. And on the surface of red blood cells are chemicals which the immune system can recognise. And there are several of these Because what was discovered was when they tried to do blood transfusions, some people would get dreadful reactions to it, which were life-threatening. Yeah, like sometimes it's saving someone's life and sometimes it's putting them in mortal danger. And before what was called cross-matching, that was the case. So you've got these antigens on the surface of red blood cells. And these antigens are determined by genetics. So you inherit the genes that produce these antigens on your red blood cells. And the antigens are recognised by the immune system. So if you've got no antigens on your red blood cell, you are O negative. So the A, B, O is one set of antigens. And then there's another set of antigens called rhesus antigens, where you can either be positive, you can either have the rhesus antigen or not. So if you are O negative, you've got no antigens. It gets more complicated than this, but this is this is the simple story. This is already pretty complicated. You and I both have got the A antigen, so we're both A. So we've got the A antigen, but I've got the rhesus antigen and you haven't. So you're A negative. B, you've got... Oh, a, I don't have it at all. No. Oh, okay, interesting. And B, if you're B positive, you've got the B antigen and you've got the rhesus. If you're B negative, you haven't got the rhesus. And if you're AB positive... You've got the A antigen, the B antigen, and the rhesus antigen. And if you're AB negative, you haven't got the rhesus antigen. So if you are O negative, you are called the universal donor, which means that you can give your blood to pretty much anybody. It's not quite true, by the way, but we'll come back to the complexity in a minute. <laughs> but the, you can give your blood to pretty much anybody in an emergency situation because you don't have any antigens that that person is going to react to. So the antigens on the surface of the blood cells are something that the immune system sees and if they like it, it, it's like, okay, cool, that's us, leave it alone. But if the immune system sees an antigen that it's not familiar with, then it's like attack and that's when someone gets sick. But if there's no antigens, then we're all good. Yeah, it's actually the red blood cells responding to it and they can burst open and you get this hemolytic crisis when the red blood cells opening. It's not just the immune system, but it's also the recognition by the red blood cell. And if you are AB positive, you're the universal recipient 
that you can receive blood from anybody because you've got all the antigens, so you can't be assaulted by anybody's antigens because you've got them all. Ugh, that's the dream. But the question is, why have we got these antigens in the first place? Yes, where did they come from and why does it differ across the population? So here's something that we have talked about on more than one occasion on What's That Rash?, and it's called pleiotropy. Uh, when something does more than one thing. It does more than one thing or indicates more than one thing. Either the genes that code for this antigen have other functions on the body or there are other genes so close to that gene on the chromosome that they go along with the inheritance and they have an effect. So there are patterns of disease that do tend to go along with different blood types. Oh, I remember really early in COVID, we had a lot of people asking, well, there seemed to be some science to indicate that people with A blood types either got COVID more or were sicker. And it was one of those things that at the time when I saw it, I was like, that sounds wrong and kind of didn't give a lot of thought to it. But then later in the pandemic, it turned out that there did seem to be some sort of at least correlation there. I think it's still a bit controversial, but there does seem to be some correlation there. And so people with A tend to have an increased risk of coronary heart disease. Not huge, but it tends to be there because it looks as though the pleiotropy, the, the genetics here, is that certain blood types increase the stickiness of your tissues. This is a gross oversimplification, but atherosclerosis depends on stickiness to attract red blood cells to the surface of the internal lining of the artery. That creates irritation and then an inflammatory reaction and cholesterol is laid down and the, and the artery thickens and fibroses and is more likely to have a blood clot on it. And so that stickiness is a really important mechanism. There are other probably immune effects that go along with other blood types. The, the research behind this is not massive, but there are indications that blood types are associated with specific diseases. And before I forget, I just want to add that complexity I was talking about earlier. Depending on your ethnic background and your genetic background, there are also other blood types that go along with this relatively crude ABO rhesus blood typing. So what I'm hearing is that there is definitely more to your blood type than just your blood, that your blood type does have an effect on other parts of your health and body. So coming to the idea of a blood type diet, it feels like there's not nothing there. No, there's not nothing there. But the question is, can you utilise that therapeutically? And does it matter more than what we measure already? For example, your cholesterol levels. So let's go through the claims in this blood type diet book that we mentioned before, that this is sort of like the patient zero of this concept. And... Tell me if this is right, Norman. Basically, the author sort of said that type O blood was the original ancestral blood type of the earliest humans and that A blood evolved when humans began to farm and that B blood types arose once people were sort of nomadic and perhaps kept dairy herds. Is that true? Well, there is some evidence to suggest it is true that the original blood type was O. But there is also evidence to suggest amongst people who look at this sort of evolutionary process is that AB was the original ancestral blood type and that O and separation of A and B evolved from that. And we'll kind of probably never know the answer to the question. Okay, on evolution, because this was something when you were talking before about certain blood type groups maybe being more prone to certain diseases, my question then is like, well, why didn't we select out for it? Like, why would that have continued? Does that give us any clues here? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. So, for example, let's just go back to coronary heart disease. Blood group A is, well, it's not a very healthy blood group, by the way. It <laughs> tends to be associated with an increased risk of cancer. And O is associated with a decreased risk of cancer. But what you're referring to is malaria. Now, malaria has been a very I'm, powerful... I am always referring to malaria um, as often as I possibly can. Because it's fascinating because malaria is a very powerful evolutionary pressure and it's a very ancient disease. And it's why, for example, thalassemia and sickle cell disease is commoner among certain groups who were exposed to malaria because having those genes protects against the malaria parasite because the red blood cell collapses when the malaria parasite goes in. So you had reinforcement of those genes and populations which were exposed to malaria. So it looks as though groups A and groups AB 
are at particular risk of severe malaria. But if that implies then that group O protects against life-threatening malaria, then O should be much, much higher in ethnic groups which were exposed to malaria. Mm. And it's not. So it may be that this is just a footprint in the sand with blood types, which indicates something else going on in the body rather than it being direct cause and effect in terms of protection or otherwise. Well, for the purposes of our mate, Peter Dadamo, who wrote the book, which is really all hinges on, the diet as it's sort of put forward in the book, which we haven't actually described yet, is that basically type O were the original hunter-gatherers, the ancestral blood type. And so they had sort of like paleo diet. And that blood type A was said to evolve when humans began to farm and they had more vegetarian diets. So maybe that is the kind of diet that blood type A people should follow. And that group B blood types were said to arise among nomadic tribes who consumed a lot of dairy products and that A and B were sort of when those people intermingled. And so what you have then is like an O blood diet that is high protein, lots of meat, not too many grains and beans, type A, fruit, veggies, tofu, that sort of thing, avoiding meat, and type B, choosing things like meat, fruit, dairy, and grains. So coming back to Nadia's question is, do they work? And the answer is, there's no evidence that they do. But there's also, you know, I think the answer is that they do work because basically all of those, except for type O blood, is... Uh, Pretty much yes. a Mediterranean diet. <laughs> it's true. You can ring the bell for just about every blood group. But when, they, when they've looked at dietary interventions in unselected groups of people to see whether or not they benefit people in clinical trials or other studies, and then they do the blood typing of those people who've benefited versus not, they don't match the blood type. Yeah. Any kind of traditional diet is probably going to be doing you good. But like you say, it really has nothing to do with your blood type. Yeah, and, and if you look at the groups who get the most benefit, it's not related to their blood time. It's related to other factors. Is there anything at all in the idea that certain diets might suit certain people's bodies better than others? Because that's really what was at the heart of Nadia's question. I think that you could say if you are A, for example, you and I should be a bit more attentive, but you know, everybody should be attentive. There's no... Oh, you think we should, like as a blood type, because we're at higher risk of cardiovascular disease? Yeah, maybe that would increase your likelihood to be much more attentive to your diet and your risk factors for coronary heart disease. But it's not that much greater than the average person to say to the average person, well, I'm, oh, I don't need to worry about this. Well, the answer is you actually do because we're all at high risk of coronary heart disease. I don't change my behaviour because I'm made positive. Maybe I should, but I don't. Well, the other part of the diet book is exercise prescription also. And so in addition to recommending specific diets to people of different blood groups, the book also recommends different types of exercise. And he recommends that AB types do calming activities and more intense physical activities to have an optimal balance, like yoga and tai chi. That sounds nice. It does sound nice, as long as you're still doing your high-intensity exercise. And don't give that up. Well, I should say, Norman, that Peter Dadamo, the author of The Blood Type Diet, who I feel like we're giving a bit of a free kick to, even though we're <laughs> undermining the claims made in his book, is not the only person to have suggested that blood types have more to do with the rest of your life than just what's running through your veins. Did you know that in Japanese culture, there's an idea that your blood type is linked to your personality? Oh, really? Yes. It is a concept called Ketsuekigata. Yeah. According to popular belief, People with type A blood are friendly and kind. Oh, my personality blows that out of the water then. <laughs> people with type B are spontaneous and creative and people with type O are confident and aggressive. Oh, well, that explains Shelby, our producer, who's O negative. <laughs> yeah, our producer Shelby's O. She's like the universal donor. I'm, I'm very in awe of her. No, so do you think you need to change your blood type based on your personality or change your personality based on your blood type? I'm obviously, this is obviously why I'm in deep doo-doos because I'm working against my biology here. Mm, mm, okay. Oh, I promise to be nice in future and not think that things like this are bullshit. Friendly and kind, Norman. Friendly and kind. Friendly and kind. A friendly and kind response, please, Norman then to Nadia's question, is there anything at all to the idea of a blood type diet? No. That's what you'd have to say from the current evidence. No, there's not. But there is a lot to your blood type, which is more than just your blood type, which indicates a pattern of risk, and you shouldn't ignore that. And in terms of medical research, 
finding things out that are associated with your blood types and how that might affect how your body responds to the world around is important. And there might be things in the future, but probably not related to your diet. And if you don't know what your blood type is, if you go and donate blood at places like Lifeblood, they'll tell you what your blood type is. And you'll also will have donated blood and saved at least three lives. So get on it. And particularly if you belong to an ethnic group where the blood supply is particularly short. And when you're doing your little to-do list, donate blood is on the to-do list. Another thing on the to-do list could be to email us at thatrash at abc.net.au with your questions or with your feedback, as a couple of people have done on our recent episode on earthing, Norman. So Kieran has written in saying, further to the episode on earthing and the challenge to provide a journal article of dubious nature, kindly find attached an abstract from Neurology Dominium Hiberniae. And he says, pay close attention to the first lines of each abstract and wonder what they spell. The title of the article is Vestibular Balance Disorder Subcategorization and a Novel Treatment by Kieran Renane, who's clearly our 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 correspondent correspondent here and is promoting his uh, excellent academic research. And the first letter of each line in the abstract spells out utter gobshite. (laughs) And we will have a copy of this excellent piece of scientific research, including the last line, which says, my study on Irish tourists in equatorial climes, N equals one. The P value is not 0.005, which... He knows his audience, Norman. That's right. Shows the effectiveness of this treatment. Good on you, Kieran. We're going to make you famous by having it in the show notes for this What's That Rash. (laughs) And he says, my book, I Can Treat Everything for a Case of Guinness, can be purchased online for twenty nine ninety five. Kieran, good on you. You are our honorary third uh, What's That Rash host from now on. That's right. I, mean, I don't know which blood type goes along with Guinness, but I assume it's universal. The universal donor. <laughs> Thick and syrupy. And Rod has also, uh, in relation to grounding, Rod has also brought us back to earth, saying you can't reliably earth yourself by holding a tap anymore. This is in reference to a couple of our letter writers from a previous episode because a lot of the plumbing is now done with plastic pipe. So maybe we do need to go and do grounding after all. That's right. It's barefoot in the park. (laughs) Good on you, Rod. I hope that's short for lightning, Rod. If you have a question or a comment for us, you can always email us. We are thatrash at abc.net.au. And I just want to say something. If we have a bit of fun with the questions, the questions we get are really great. And we choose them because they're important issues that need to be covered and people have genuine questions. So don't hold back. Send us in your questions and we'll tackle them no matter how difficult. Yeah, we make fun of each other, not of you. Correct. See you next time. See you then. Thank you.